We all know Dr. Palmieri. She's been with us for 19 years now, um, been one of the key leaders of the hospital, been former chief of staff, been involved with a lot of research, and she is the uh, director of research for the department, or vice president, or whatever the heck it is. So uh, <laughs> her talk today is going to be about the state of the research for our department. So go ahead, Dr. Palmieri. So thank you, Dr. Greenhall. It just goes to show you get no respect. Uh, today, you know, research, we've talked about a lot of things in the last few weeks. You know, we talked about global surgery, and last week we talked about quality. And this week we're going to talk about the thing that really makes the difference between a good department and a great department. Good departments give clinical care, and they're outstanding in clinical care. Great departments lead clinical care, and you lead clinical care by defining, the re defining quality of care, and that happens to research. And I'm going to show you a journey today that we as a department have taken, and I think everybody in this room just about is, in, is going to be in here somewhere, because everyone in here has contributed to this journey and how this department has grown in terms of research in the past uh, 30 years. So I have no financial disclosures. I've done a few things, worked with a few people, and gotten into the appropriate amount of trouble at the right amount of time, okay? Which you all do, right? What's the famous phrase? You gotta break a few eggs to make an omelet. We're not breaking eggs to make an omelet in surgery. We're making a souffle. So we gotta whip them up a little bit in addition to breaking them. So that's exactly what's been happening this, the last few years in the Department of Surgery. So we're going to talk about the past of surgery and about UC Davis. So how many people here have actually gone back and researched the origins of this university, of this place you're at? Ah, see, I knew Dr. Good and I would have it. He's always on top of it. We're going to talk about some of the research education accomplishments. There are a lot of really smart people in this room who have been really undercover who are going to get blown off. I'm going to identify who are the top publishers by PubMed. And we might actually get some people to put their computers down and actually watch the presentation today. We're going to define the research goals for the Department of Surgery. And we're going to talk about some of the educational opportunities and research that are available. So anyone who knows me knows that life is about hiking. So everything is about hiking, right? Research is a lot like hiking. I would tell you both of these people are looking forward. They're looking into the unknown. They're looking towards a discovery. Now, their discoveries are very different, OK? The first guy, I mean, he's probably hoping he doesn't like fall into those clouds, which would be kind of not cool. And this other person is probably tr equally trying to find something. They're trying to find something in terms of a research. So when you start out, and you're going to start out in research, the first thing you got to do is know where you're coming from, OK? Because knowing where you're coming from and what your roots are determines are you going to be a city person on the bottom screen of the right, or are you a country person? Fundamentally different. You would have different goals. Maybe hiking's not your thing, or maybe not country hiking's your thing, but you're like the most awesome city walker and shopper. Okay, still a form of hiking. Your feet are still moving forward. You are still walking. You're just stopping for some interesting things every once in a while. But it, uh, it will what you are and where you come from determines what you do. So what about UC Davis? Where do we come from? Okay, in this institution. Well, it started in 1908 and 1909. We started as a farm school with 18 students. This, I'm thinking this is the first, this is the earliest picture I could find. There's supposed to be 18 students. Now there's two dudes. There's a hat. Here, let's see if our arrow. This guy is a hat behind this guy. So this guy's sleeping, and this is another guy, and then there's one knee over here. And I come up with 17 people, plus, or I can get 18 if these two are students. I'm hoping he's not a student. Um, and the instructor. So I'm assuming this is the first class, but this, we're founded in agriculture. This, hospi or this university is founded out of a community need for, for research in agriculture. And that's how we grew. In 1980, 1938, our campus renamed, was renamed the College of Agriculture at Davis. We weren't even a university yet. 
The, the vet school actually started in 1946, which explains a lot as, how, as to why the vet school is mu much more developed than a lot of the other places. They started giving graduate degrees in 49, and the College of Letters and Science came in about 51. We weren't actually named a UC school until 1959, so we're young. Okay, Harvard was already like sending people out, Codman or whatever, you know, he was like at MGH, he was like already dead and buried and we weren't even born yet. Okay, so we're a pretty young university. We're kind of like upstarts, which is kind of why I like it here. Um, in 65, the law school opens, and a big expansion. The 60s, Berkeley, all the fun stuff is happening, and you know, all Dr. Greenhall's favorite songs are happening right about this time. <laughs> and the School of Medicine opens. And the vet school now, we haven't even started, or barely started. And the vet school's number one in the nation. And in 1978, uh, actually in 1977, this was a landmark for in terms of the medical school here. There was a 10-year purchase agreement for UC Davis Medical Center signed with the Sacramento County Hospital. Where we're at now was a fairgrounds, and before that, and, and across the, the, right down the hall was actually the county hospital, and we've kind of expanded. This is how the university hospital was actually born. So the university hospital part, we're talking 1977. So now we're, real, now we're babes in the wood compared to Harvard, okay? We're just like infants, which is good. You know, infants move faster, they have more energy. And, and we actually started uh, from the ground with our trauma service. Dr. Blaisdell came from San Francisco. He invented trauma, basically. And he brought it here, and he established a trauma center. And he actually ran the burn center, believe it or not. He was the burn surgeon for a few years. They still remember. And we led the PhDs. And then things started rolling. Agriculture kept going. Education was founded. We even got a Gates Foundation scholarship. Yes, Bill Gates actually did give something to us. We are the most sustainable university in the world, and we had developed the world's first thousand processor chip, whatever that is. I'm assuming that's something that does a lot. Okay. Uh, and our vet school continues to be outstanding. It's number one in the world. Okay, and we all know about the Betty Irene Moore. So we have come huge ways. We came from a local need. We literally have grown over time. And we continue to have opportunities for growth. The good thing about being the new kid on the block is you bring fresh eyes, and you have room for expansion, and you're more technologically adept. So all you guys are more technologically adept than all your attendings, right? Because you grew up in it, and we're trying to learn it. So what about the Department of Surgery? We came from that community need. We talked about the trauma. We, clinical programs rapidly grew, and Dr. Goodnight helped us bring the cancer center and cancer research to the fore. The bottom picture is a picture of the airplane crashing into Farrell's ice cream parlor, which was one of the biggest air disasters un, until that time in, in the 1970s, and that's what started the burn unit, was there was no burn center for over, um, people died because there was no burn unit here. And so that's the foundation of our burn unit. So a lot of our centers start from the community need and come up. And because we're grounded in the community, it's one of our intrinsic strengths is we're, we're built into everything and we're built into our system. So now if you're gonna hike or whatever you're gonna do, even if you're going to go through and do the shopping thing, you know, that's a form of exercise I said, you have to know the terrain, right? You're not gonna go to Neiman Marcus if you have like 10 bucks in your pocket. Okay, you're going to go somewhere else, you've got to scope it out. And the same thing if you're going to go in the country, you've got to know if you've got legs that can hike uphill or if you like the flatlands. Okay, there's nothing wrong with either one. They're very different. But you have to know your terrain. And where are we? We're not in San Francisco. We're east of San Francisco. And we are in an area of great need. Okay, we're it until the northern California border. If you look at our transfer uh, patterns, we are very much Northern California's hospital. We have both urban and rural catchment area, which differentiates us from many hospitals. And what also differentiates us from many of the big name schools is because we're grounded in the community, we have a broad, diverse patient population. Other places would kill for our patient diversity and our numbers, but we've got it. 
So we're thinking research. You're like, wait, you're supposed to be talking about research. And I've heard about cows and I've heard about the vet school. Now we're going to get to research. Where were we? Okay. I came here, God help me, in 1999. Okay. So in 2001, we were ranked as an institution 62nd in the nation. Yeah. Okay. By 2009, we improved somewhat. But still, 49 just doesn't sound right. I mean, you make the top 50, you know. You can, now you can say you made top 50. What about the Department of Surgery? Well, we were a little later coming up. So we started uh, with a little bit lower. So in 2010, we were 40th in the nation. 11, 42nd. In 2012, we didn't even make the list of the top 50. Those are the facts. So we sat down and looked at that and said, you know, if we're going to lead academic surgery, you got to improve our research. Just what you got to do. Okay? This is part of the growing pains. We had expanded clinically phenomenally. One of the best expansions clinically ever in a department of surgery. Now the next phase. Bring it to the next level. There's always room for improvement. So now, my job as vice chair of research became, okay, let's grow some research. So how are we going to do this? Well, like all good hikers, well... <laughs> Those who know me know this doesn't happen with me sometimes. Um, is that you get a map and you plot out your course. Okay, you gotta know where you're gonna go. If you just start going randomly at things, it's not gonna happen. And the same thing is particularly true with research. Research doesn't just happen. Yes, there are side trips that get very, very. They might change your direction because very few things in life are, life are straight ahead, right? Life is about curves and how you deal with the curves. So, the organization decided it was going to invest in research. Okay, so UC Davis said, we're ready to jump. How are we going to define what we jump? And they did that via the CTSC, which they build the future of research on teamwork and teams. Incredible insight, right? It's no longer about individuals doing research. It's about teams doing research. And as Dr. Holcroft has been known to cite to this very audience, there's actually a study in science that if you take the smartest person in a room and a group of people who aren't as smart as that one person and you give them the same problem, the group will have a better solution than the smartest person every time. Group thinking, because you bring the diversity of thought, you bring different actions, the group have, collectively will move things forward faster and better than the individual. So team science, team, then UC Davis did this. I don't know if they knew that study or not. But that's the form they chose to progress science forward, as well as obviously continuing to fund individual researchers who are talented. They invested in the tra Clinical Translation Science Center, one of the t first 12 institutions. We were the ones that knocked people's socks off. They're like, oh, it's Harvard and it's Stanford and UC Davis? And we have sustained that, which is even more surprising to them. We're the hidden guys who actually have the talent to do it, and we're doing it. Okay. UC Davis invested in faculty and students. They invested in Dr. Farmer. And we grew as an institution. So what did we invest in in surgery? We hired new people. A few of these folks, hmm, I think this Dr. Hiroshi character here, I think we know him and Dr. Cook, who is now our new faculty mentor helper. Uh, what is it now? Oh, OK, see? <laughs> that's, why, that's why he's moving up in the world, because he Better just he goes for it. Dr. Wang, OK, he's Revolut Bioengineering. And Dr. Lloyd. Mouse biology, the mouse biology lab, a huge potential for us to really leverage some basic science research by expanding. We just, uh, this is, he's a veterinarian. We, we added a PhD and a veterinarian to the Department of Surgery. Best things we ever did. We got vice chairs for education, for research, for clinical affairs. Surgery Research Day, 10 years ago, Surgery Research Day consisted of 12 people presenting 12 abstracts on the 14th floor conference room of Davis. Okay, now what do we have? We had more than 50 abstracts, incredibly talented people doing phenomenal work, and it's a whole day. You guys are why. Okay, the research is expanding in the department. 
and we got some grants and stuff. So what happened to UC Davis? We're now 26th as an institution nationwide. So it went from 62 to 26. Not bad for an upstart, right? We're, we're outclassing a lot of these 100-year-old institutions right now. <laughs> what about the Department of Surgery? What happened? We're ranked sixth in the nation. Okay, we're really, uh, we really love this, okay? Because, <laughs> hey, we like being upstarts, and it fits our personality, right? We have our roots, we keep going. How much money is this, by the way? You're like, what does number six mean? Now, this is only NIH money, by the way. This does not count our Department of Defense grants, which would actually vault us even higher. But we're talking $11 million here. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to have like a big party or anything, guys, because most of that money actually goes to the research. <laughs> um, but you can see that we are consistently over that $10 million mark. That's pretty incredible. Okay, we, we have a lot to be proud of in these last few years, and it comes from the hard work in this room. Who are we against? University of Michigan was number one in the most recent polls. 2018 will not be out until January 1st, 2019. And note the list of the top 10. I'll tell you that nationwide, in terms of receipt of federal funding, Hopkins leads it with $2 billion but that's more than just grants. Hopkins gets a lot of stuff from a lot of things federally. <laughs> Maybe because they're closer to that Trump guy. Um, some of that stuff happens. Okay, so the next thing you want to do is you're on the main, you got your map, you got your compass, and you start walking, right? So you got to make sure you're kind of like following where you kind of said, sort of where you said you're going to go. You know, you still might wander around a little bit and meander, but see how you're doing. So how are we doing in growth department of surgery? Remember I said we were an upstart. Okay, the dark blue line is us, okay? This is our growth in terms of research over the past, oh, 10 years. <coughs> and all those lines below, like Colorado, sorry, Dr. Jerkovich, and Wisconsin, and Case Western, and Oregon, and Minnesota, their growth rate is less than ours. It's nice to be an upstart, okay? We're growing, we're growing fast because we're, we're, I think a lot of it's because we're young and we, we're kind of in that agile mode. We're not so um, administratively overburdened that we can actually move more agilely than many other places. How do we compare against the other UCs? We are the yellow line, just so that you know. And note that we are making some steady gains uh, on UCSF there. We're going to catch them. I have confidence in our capabilities of catching them in terms of funding. And we will get there with a little bit of time and a little bit of energy. So how do we get our money? And this is something we have to think about. Where do research funds come from? For us right now, it's almost all federal, which is a strength and a potential weakness for us, right? Because if you put all your eggs in one basket, what happens if the basket has a hole in it? Or if you know funds get diverted to like building a wall somewhere? Okay, those kinds of things can be an issue. So you always want to make sure that you're thinking ahead and looking for that rock in the middle of, a, of the trail so that you don't like fall over it and fall on your face. Okay, you want to make sure you have a way around it. And it turns into about this amount of, of money. So we're talking some serious money. Okay, here comes the competition. Now, I wouldn't be a, a vice chair of research if I didn't start showing the type A's, what they're doing. So we're going to have a whole series of slides where we're going to show what people are doing. So every year, everyone submits proposals for their research. And you notice that if you're a basic science researcher, which I would hope that you would have the most, right? Because if you're doing basic science, it's kind of your job to turn in proposals. So they're doing pretty well. But each of these other divisions also turns in proposals. Now, the red lines are those proposals you turned in outside of the Department of Surgery, so someone else did the work, and you're turning it in through someone else, whereas the blue bars are the bars that you actually worked through our administration in the Department of Surgery to get the grant, and hence that those funds will flow through the Department of Surgery. And then your greens are your total. So the goal for me as a Vice Chair of Research is to get as many people as possible to actually 
flow the funds through the Department of Surgery so that we can continue to build programs. So one thing you learn in research is that you got to turn in a lot of proposals to get a little bit of money. It's about three, three grants maybe per 10 you turn in, something like that, about 30%. <laughs> And I used to add a mile to my hike every time I got rejected. It was getting pretty long there. It's still pretty long, but I had to stop because there is a limit. <laughs> but you get used to rejection when you do proposals, but there's nothing like that feeling. And note that you submit about 46 proposals to get about 20 funded. Okay, so you have to be accustomed to a little bit of rejection. And this shows how many dollars by division people are earning. So the blue is proposed and the red is awarded. Again, not the best feel good slide. But here's one. This is how much in dollars everybody each division brought in. And you can see that every division has its own thing. Again, those through surgery, those others, uh, and those that are brought the total. And you can see that which are leading divisions in terms of bringing in grant dollars uh, for surgery. And yes, vascular and bariatrics does have it. Our scale is just a little odd. So with the, everyone is contributing on this slide. So you can get a lot of grants, but really when it comes to your personal reputation, it's all about your publications, right? And so each division has its own publication. And as you're thinking about doing your research time, you're going to want to think about Number one, does someone have money so that I can actually like do the research? And if I do the research, I can travel to like present it. And two, am I going to get the publications that I need to move on to where I need to go? Okay, those are two that, I mean, this is strategy from a resident and a medical student perspective. You have to think about these things. And these are the publication records by service. And you can see that we have a robust series of publications by every service. And you think, okay, that's a pretty good number. So in 10 years, uh, the trauma division had 350 publications. Okay, that's pretty cool. Okay, so how about by faculty? And you can see it averages out once you've leveled the playing field for the number of faculty in a division, is that our folks are getting probably about, you know, four or five publications a year per faculty member, and some a little bit more, some a little bit less. So you can see here who's got the publications and who's doing it. So I went in, and I'm going to caveat by this is Dr. Palmieri going into PubMed. This is what anyone going into PubMed. I actually went through every faculty member in the Department of Surgery. I looked under your last name with no initials. I looked under with your first initial, your middle initial, your maiden name, any permutation of your name that I was ever aware of, and I gave you credit for anything that looked remotely like you might have published it, <laughs> and I counted. Okay, I had PubMed count for me all of the publications for our faculty in the Department of Surgery. So it was quite a, uh, there's a hole in my wall, because there was someone who had a nickname. Oh, okay, but these are our top publishers for last year. And on the right, this is something, if you actually go on the UC Davis website, you can look at people's collaborations on their research. And it is like the most, and if you want, I can give you the website. But you can look up yourself and anybody else. And I happened to show Dr. Greenhall because he was in the office across the way, and he heard me pounding on the wall. And I, had, I felt I owed him something. So anyways, this is Dr. Greenhall's set of, of buds. And you notice that nobody does research in isolation. I mean, look at that network. He knows more people than any of us here. That's a lot. Okay, so that's for one year. This is for five years, and this is Dr. Farmer. And notice she's got kind of a bimodal thing going on here. She's got like two things, and the same. these are the leaders in publications for the last five years in our department. Again, pretty intricate networks. Dr. Jerkovich is coming up the backside here. You know, that, that, the transition year is always painful. And 10 years. Now, Dr. Jerkovich, I had to eliminate you on this one because you hadn't been here even half of that time, but you, were, you would have been top five, just saying. Okay. And this is Dr. Cantor's buds. Okay, and notice he has a different kind of bud network. His is more kind of balanced and really surprising, symmetrical and, you know, kind of well-balanced and everything. It kind of, you know, fits. 
These are our top five for 10 years. So yes, Big Brother is watching. Uh, you know, we're getting PubMed, Google, um, PubMed uh, sore, but this is, these are our top publishers for the Department of Surgery. So we're, we are kind of watching out for things. So, but you're like, okay, what about the future? We got what's going on. What's the future? Okay, how far are you gonna go? You're gonna go on that John Muir trail? I don't do the tent thing, but you know, for those of you who do the tent thing, you know, God help you. <laughs> okay, the real key to research is you. It's not me, it's not division chiefs, it's our medical students, it's our residents, it's our fellows. You guys are the future. And the number of you of residents, medical students, and fellows that are engaging in research is going up. And this is the proudest thing ever for us, is because you're the future. You are the guys who are going to solve the problems that we're dealing with today. And like as I mentioned before, Surgery Research Day has become a lot of fun because of our residents. What programs are available? Okay, so for young faculty and for medical students and residents, there's something here for everybody. There's four programs I'm gonna talk about today. Mentored Clinical Research Training Program, MCRTP. You have to practice that one a lot. The Pre-Doctoral and Postdoctoral Clinical Research Training Program, that's for med students and, uh, and postdocs. The Birch Program, for anyone interested in women's health, and the Paul Calabrese Clinical Oncology Program, we're gonna talk about all of them. So MCRTP is a clinical patient-oriented research. So basically, you're gonna learn translational research, team-based translational research, good for junior faculty, fellows, postdoctoral scholars, you, there's a combination of didactics. Basically, you have to commit to letting that person be uh, in class for a two-week block initially, and then consistently throughout the year. So people get a master's in clinical research and then become eligible for K-12. So this is a time commitment. So every division that actually has one of their junior faculty do this, the rest of the faculty has to pick it up um, because you got to give people time to do it. You have to give the people time off. And lo and behold, these are all the people the Department of Surgery has put through. Okay, We have been one of the leading contributors to the MCRTP. And notice some of these people, I don't know, who is this Hediati person or this Cantor person? These are some of our best researchers who go through the MCRTP. You actually get a great glimpse. And yeah, who's this Jessica Cox or Laura Gielginski? They sound familiar, like I should know who they are. Of course I know who you are, right? This provides you that insight, it provides you that training, it provides you that little extra edge on what resources are available and what you can do. And it does lead to some productivity, which I'll show you in a little bit. So for those medical students in the audience who are thinking, geez, this is way too much for me. This is, the, this is great, this next one for medical students. This is the TL1 pre and postdoctoral clinical research training program. It's for juniors, uh, trainees for a team science approach, med students, pre-doc students, postdoc scholars, but you have to be interested in multidisciplinary clinical and translational research. Notice it's team building. This is what UC Davis invests in, is team research. And you have to have a project guided by a faculty member. So if you are interested in this and you have a topic you're interested in, go find a faculty, talk to them. Almost any faculty in our department would be happy to sponsor a student or a postdoc. You just need to come up to someone. If you need help with that, you can always come up to me, and, if you're in, and I will help point you in the direction you need to go. You don't have to do burns. You can do bariatrics. You can do trauma. You can do anything. I will get you to the person you need to get to. And you do get some like money, so like a stipend, which is helpful. And if you want to get a uh, master's, you can get it. And these are all the T1 scholars who have come through the department. So we've actually helped some medical students get some training, and it's, it's really a lot of fun on both ends because, again, you've got the technologically adept with the technologically uh, less adept, we'll put it that way. Okay, the KL2 program, this is for junior faculty, and this is one people always like because there's like salary dollars with this one. And uh, there is some training, there's some coursework, and then there, obviously you have to do some presentations. And Birch is a th a very similar to that, only it's for women health studies. And this is one where we in surgery have not tapped into. If you are interested in women's health issues or sex and gender determinants, this is a grant that we have not been able to leverage much in the Department of Surgery. And we have a lot of people here who are interested in women's health. So this is one that I think would be good. 
And the Paul Calabrese we have taken great advantage of, as you're about to see in a minute. And there are two tracks. So if you're a basic science researcher, there's one. If you're a clinical science researcher, there's another one. So there's something for everybody. And these, I'm happy to say, we've got a couple case scholars. We've got Lisa Brown, who's a case scholar, as well as Amanda Crane, who is a Paul Calabrese scholar. So we have two faculty, and just when you think that faculty is, are done with their training, <laughs> no, it just, gets, it just gets piled on to the rest of the day. So there are, and you know, my hats are, is off because it's really hard to take one of these courses while you're still doing all your clinical stuff and maintaining everything else. So this was all started under Dr. Goodnight's tenure. All these educational things, he set the tone, we're moving forward, and that's why we're moving forward now in the educational department. Okay, here it comes. We've had some bodacious resident research. I'm gonna say some very productive people in the research lab. These are the folks who came, well, the picture, I couldn't find a picture of just you research people. I'm very not <laughs> adept at this. Okay, so this year we're gonna take a picture, photo ops that I, in the future I can show like the, the resident cadre, so I did the best I could. You guys are looking pretty sharp. These are our folks who just left the lab. We, the, I mean, that's a pretty good publication record and lots of awards. Okay, the other thing I recognize is that I need better keep better track of your awards because you guys get so many I can't list them all anymore. So we want to keep track of all those. And this, these, are, these are the gang that are here now. The people who are doing their second year research are on the left. The people who are just starting are on the right. When I started here as a faculty, we had maybe three people go into research every year. Now look at it. This is pretty awesome. Um, and this is, this is uh, it's, it's great to see this growth and to see how people are moving forward. So what other, pro do our programs go have for research? We have lots of programs. And Dr. Ali left, and I'm just gonna mention bariatric. Um, bariatric does the microbiome and determining if your microbiome of your gut is either good or bad in terms of obesity, okay? So if you're interested in obesity and microbiome, talk to Dr. Ali. If you're interested in burns, and of course, everybody who's anybody's interested in burns, no, I'm kidding. Um, burn, the burn division has a long history of research with Dr. Greenhall doing everything from sepsis to looking at basic science in the glucocorticoid receptor. Actually, every burn faculty except Dr. Greenhall has gone through MCRTP, and we're all thinking of pitching in together and making him do it. But I, think he's, I don't think they're gonna accept you, Dave, because I think you're just a little over the age limit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but the burn, actually, if you're looking for funding for your research, the burn division does actually have a funded research position every year. So for resident research. And so if anyone wants to take advantage of it, you are welcome to. Dr. Sen is a whiz at all things database. Okay, they can help with it. And Dr. Romanowski got a UC Davis Diagnostic Collaborative Integration Grant before she even got here. So that was she, they let her apply because she had signed her contract, which is always good. The thoracic surgery department has been growing very nicely. Uh, Dr. Cook and, and the gang, uh, we already saw the K2, right? That is a big deal. They've got a P. Corey and the Paul Calabrese scholarship. And you can see their H faculty index, very nice. Pediatric surgery, this comes from Dr. Ijin Wang. This is one of our basic science labs that is one of the most popular among our residents. I must say that I think more than half of our research residents have something to do with Dr. Farmer's lab. And Dr. Wang is the leader. It goes everything from the stem cell treatment of spina bifida to scaffolds and targeting endothelialization and neovascularization. So if you're interested in basic science, the sheep, you know, and watching the bulldogs kind of walk around and, you know, kind of have their little diaper on but walk, you know, they got one thing solved, they're working on number two, so to speak. Um, plastic surgery has a lot of very talented surgeons, ranging from Dr. Wong, who actually won some awards, uh, Dr. Sahar, who also has a basic science lab, and Dr. Pu, uh, who has a very vast clinical experience that he writes about very eloquently. Um, they also have very many opportunities. And you notice that they had a lot of grants that they submitted. So they have a lot of small grants that are very nice for resident awards. Surgical oncology has been expanding 
quite mightily over the past few years with Dr. Carranging from Dr. Campbell and parathyroid glands. I'm still trying to figure out how, my, how you ended up in oncology, but it kind of works. I mean, the gland is connected to some growth or something, I guess. Um, but you're developing. Dr. Cantor has been going gangbusters. No, he was an MCRTP graduate. And you had a Calabrese, didn't you? You had a Calabrese. Yes. yes. Uh-huh. And Dr. Bowl, kind of leading the charge. And Dr. Corain is one of our new K awards. The transplant surgeons are famous for transplanting neonatal kidneys and for this ex vivo perfusion system which is one of their landmark findings has enabled them to actually do those transplants. They invented the system that lets them do neonatal uh, kidney transplant in adults. Um, and they have a nice series. Notice the bottom one seems to be someone who's not attending. It's kind of like a, a very talented resident, but don't let it go to your head. Um, <laughs> doing some really fine work in, in, in that lab. Trauma surgery is probably has our biggest faculty accoutrement. There's like 17 trauma surgeons. You are killing me on that faculty uh, publication thing. By the time I got through 17 of you, I was like cross-eyed. Um, but very productive and growing in great leaps and bounds. We got Dr. Brown, who does some basic science on the inflammatory response, especially we've heard with pulmonary embolism. Dr. Jerkovich has a whole bunch of things going on, PTSD, and you just you have another uh, thing that you just signed up with. Um, Dr. Schatz, Kokono, and Jerkovich have some industry-funded uh, studies. We've got some soft tissue infections, uh, some ventilator management, splenic vaccinations. All of these are going on. Misty Humphreys in vascular surgery has some studies. She was also a K award. She was also MCRTP and is winning awards by leaps and bounds. So now where do we go? Okay, you gotta avoid the pitfalls. You know, you don't wanna be this guy. Okay, or this girl, she's kind of frozen. I think she's a trauma patient of the future because she has no place to go up, down, or sideways. And this guy's doing it right. If you're just gonna jump, just do it, okay? Don't stop in the middle, it's not a good idea. So what you wanna do to avoid those pitfalls is do what's called a SWOT analysis. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So we've got all these great things going on that I've already talked about. We have opportunities. We can recruit some scientists in our department, and we're actively recruiting for that to expand our translational research. We're involving outcomes research, uh, research support, and Dr. Cook is leading this amazing outcomes group. It's Wednesdays at 6 o'clock. Is it the second Wednesday? Uh, Tuesdays. Tuesday. Tuesday. See? Uh, Tuesdays at 4. There you go. It's room 3108? Uh, the second floor of Cyprus. Second floor of Cyprus. See, what can I say? I purposely actually, I purpose, no, I'm on the list, but I purposely don't attend because this is one that is for, the, I call it the younger crowd. When us old folks get in, we gum up the works, and I want minds to expand because I'm always there, I'm always around at that time, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna break your, your growth because it's an amazing group that is doing a lot of great stuff. Just free publicity, sir. Um, we, we're reorganizing the clinical research unit, making it easier for people to turn in those proposals and to do that research and establish a research endowment fund. What are we lacking? We need more senior people, okay? We do need some more people who have gone through the system and are getting old and, you know, gray hair and all that kind of stuff. We need some more research space, okay? When you grow, you get limited by space. We're looking for an, uh, an epidemiologist to help us with our research and, you know, get some more, getting extramural funding is a challenge. And finally, this is the not fun part of the job, which is what I'm gonna have to deal with. You, there's a regulatory burden, okay? When you expand your growth, that's what you want, you have to set it off. But at some point, you gotta follow the rules, okay? Most of us don't look good in orange jumpsuits, okay? We don't want to get there. Okay? Hopkins was shut down for a while because of violations of regulatory stuff. So we have to make sure that while we're growing, we're kind of keep it legal, okay? Kind of like marijuana, no, never mind. Um, <laughs> so this is what keeps it legal, the IRB and the IACUC. We've got a lot of proposals out there. When you got more than 100, you got to start thinking about pruning it. That's a bit much, okay? 
Um, and even the 40 is a bit much. So because you can't keep you can't keep that many things under control. So before you do research, I know everyone's dying to do research. There's this great thing called city training. Okay, this is what gets you smart in research. It tells you the rules. Okay, because so you don't want to get busted before you even start. Okay, it's not you'll learn all about Tuskegee Institute and why it is there's rules. This tells you how to do it. And if you're going to do a clinical trial, there's also something called GCP training, which is mandatory as well. Um, if you have a question, I'm going to show you some email addresses to talk to these people. And I'm sure these slides will be available, but this is an absolute must. If you are a research resident this year or are planning on doing it, just get your city done now. Have some fun. Then you can do all the, all the retro chart reviews you want and everything. You're cool. All projects have to go through Dr. Farmer's office. We need to track them just to make, we can help you stay legal, okay? If you run it through our through the department, we can offload some of your work. But you have to run it through to do that. Um, complete that application. If you have problems with it, we're going to give you some email addresses that can help and share the project with the Department of Surgery, okay? That way we can help you track and stay on time so that you don't get busted for something because, you know, you're, we're all busy and this is one of our, the things we can do to help you. And the, these are the details. We will have the slides posted on our website because no, um, for, except for those of you who are so compulsive that you are clicking it now, which is fine, but you won't finish city before I'm done. Okay. And why do it? First of all, I can only brag about you if I know what you're doing because you guys don't hear it here, but when I'm at a meeting, I'm scoping out things and I'm bragging about your accomplishments. That's my job, is to brag about your accomplishments and find grants for people. If I see a grant for someone in this room, I will email it to them. That doesn't mean I'm going to do it for you, but I will, I will try and link you up with people as best as, 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 as I can. It helps with collaboration. Okay, We can get you to that collaborator if we know who they are. I might not be the right collaborator for something, but someone else may be. If I can get you to that person, that's a success. It helps you to maintain studies because it's team science. The future is team science. It's not the individual. You need to build that science team. And it also helps you get that mentoring that you need. And there's respect for patients, right? If your study is worthy enough to do, you need to make sure it's okay for your patients. Okay, That's part of what you'll learn about with Tuskegee. So here are the contacts by division for the people who help them put their research projects in. Okay, I'm probably going to make some enemies with this list. But these are the people who actually help our faculty put their IRBs in. Okay, so this is a good one to know. And any of the three of us, I'm the vice chair. Maricela Gonzalez is the whiz with the finance. If you don't know how to budget for your grant, go to her. Mary Beth Lawless, who's sitting towards the back of the room, is the administrative and regulatory whiz. If you are not sure if it's legal or moral, talk to her. If you don't know, she's very good. She's very nice. And she will also, we can also help with those IRBs. Because the first time you do an IRB, it's a bit of a challenge. We actually have some templates we can help out with some of it. So if you have the idea and we have the template, we can unite you. And it can save you at least two weeks' work. Okay, so big, strong advice. Finally, last two tips. Always lean forward, especially if you have poles, by the way, because the only time you fall with poles is if you lean backwards. Okay. Especially if you feel like you're falling. Now, note this guy in this, over here on the right. Now, if he leans backwards, he's, he's toast, man. Okay? So lean forward, keep going, because you're going to land somewhere good. And all things ultimately are better with friends. Okay? When, whether it be hiking, whether it be research, whether it be clinical, and this is my network. You notice I'm a little bimodal myself. Don't go there. Um, but things are always better when you're hiking with a few friends. It makes the trip so much more fun. So the Department of Surgery, we've grown a lot in five years. By the way, this is the roof of my house with what it looked like this weekend. We are ranked in the top 10 departments of surgery nationwide. And our future lies in expanding the, our education base, just getting new collaborations, reaching forward. It, it, it depends on everybody in this room. And we are definitely on our way. 
And with your help, we're going to make it to that next phase and the next expansion for research and surgery. Thank you. That is one of the things we are actually working on. I've got, uh, and that's part of why I want, I'm working on linking the, I, I have a list of IRB approved uh, projects uh, for the most part, but I need that linkage. Um, I, for, there are several divisions we've got it all for and others that not quite so much. But if people are looking and you're looking for a specific division, we can help you find it. All right. Have a great morning, everybody. Take care. Thank you.